Welcome to the Music for the Soul podcast, where we talk honestly about difficult things. This is a place where music, hope, and healing come together. I'm Becky Nordquist. Today, it may be one of my most favorite podcasts. We are going to have a wonderful interview with the one, the only, incredible, I like to call him the Grand Pooba, Steve Seiler. Steve Seiler is an award-winning songwriter, video producer, and music producer. He's also a speaker, author, and founder and director of Music for the Soul. Through his work through Music for the Soul, he has been called the father of the healing Christian music movement. As a songwriter, Seiler has had over 500 of his songs recorded in Christian pop and country markets. Nominated for multiple Dove Awards, Mr. Seiler won Inspirational Song of the Year with I Will Follow Christ, Circle of Friends, and Not Too Far From Here. Those are some of the best known of his nine number one contemporary Christian songs and 45 top 10 singles. As a speaker, Steve Seiler has appeared at the National Center on Sexual Exploitation Summit, the National Right to Life Convention, and the American Association of Christian Counselors, among many others. He is the author of two books, The Praise and Worship Devotional and Music for the Soul, Healing for the Heart, Lessons from a Life in Song. And yes, I had to read all of that because he will never talk about that stuff unless I force him into it. So we also know him as a dear beloved co-host here. And uh, I'm just so excited to talk with you today. Welcome as a guest to the Music for the Soul podcast. Well, thank you, Becky. I'd like to say that out of all the titles that you uh, mentioned in that reading, I think Grand Poobah is my favorite. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and one minor correction, the one and only Steve Seiler, that is not true. I actually found out once when doing a search that there are 40 Steve Seilers in the United States alone. So, you know, not as Details, unique as you details. Think. No, but you are the Steve Seiler. They're just Steve Seiler. You're the Steve Seiler, okay, right? Well, so I know that probably our listeners are interested in knowing, you know, the really important details about your family. And I wanted to start just by saying, I personally adore your wife. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Meredith is a doll. And I just wanted you to share a little bit about you guys and your kiddos. And I know you have some adorable grandbabies. I do. My wife, Meredith, and I have been married now uh, this year. Wow. Will be our 40th wedding anniversary. Woohoo! Who it just may take. We're still working on it. Uh, we have... <laughs> God bless her. I mean, I mean, God bless you both. <laughs> yes, thank you. We have two children. My daughter, Stephanie, who is 33. My son, Henry, who is 29. They are both in the helping professions. My daughter is the executive director of the Nashville Recovery Center for people coming mm -hmm. out of rehab. And my son uh, teaches English as a second language and, and English in high school in Northern California. Uh, Stephanie has given us three lovely grandchildren, Cleo, Noah, who is a girl, by the way, and uh, Arthur, our youngest. The name Noah, Stephanie floored us when she told us about that name because that name comes from the Old Testament. Noah was the first woman to advocate for herself in the Bible. So that gives you an idea about the, the strength of my daughter and, and where her passions lie. So great. Wonderful, wonderful family that you have. And of course, music for the soul is our topic of the day because it's so important to talk about beginnings and history. And so I'm very excited to have you share with our listeners some of the history and how it came to be. So. I know as an aspiring songwriter, I'm always very interested in a songwriter's journey. I'm wondering if you'd be willing to share with our listeners about your personal journey and what that looked like when you started writing music. Well, sure. Here's another way that I'm not unique. I was watching TV with my parents one Sunday evening in the late 1960s as a small child. And this uh, group called the Beatles came on the television set. <laughs> Uh, so I'm about as unique as a grain of sand on the beach when I say <laughs> that that was what inspired me to want to be a songwriter. I looked at that, at that and I said, well, that looks like a good job, right? All the girls are screaming and 
So my dad bought me a guitar and, and from the very beginning, I wanted to be a writer. So I started writing songs when I was about 10. It, it took a, a little while until I had to you know, learn three or four chords, but I started writing songs. And from the very beginning, in retrospect, I can see that from the very beginning, I had a gift for melody that was heaven sent. The lyrics were pretty laughable uh, back, <laughs> back in those days and continued to be pretty laughable for a good many years. But after about 10,000 hours of, of woodshedding, as they call it, uh, <laughs> Sometime in the 30s, my, my lyrics caught up with my, my melodies. And so I, I signed my first staff deal at the age of 37. Mm. So uh, perseverance, I would say, uh, is one of the biggest parts of my story. I, I just didn't have any give up. I wanted it. I wanted it badly. I was willing to work for it. And I was willing to do whatever I had to do in the meantime to work toward it. And that included, I think this is, you know, we talked about Meredith already. I had a, a meeting with a publisher when I was in my 20s, and he said, uh, how many hours a day do you spend at the writing desk? And he saw the hesitation. It was brief, but he saw the hesitation. And before I could even answer, he said, if you're not spending several hours a day at the writer's desk, then you're not serious. Mm -hmm. And so I was working full time at A&M Records at that time. And I sat down and I crafted out a schedule whereby I would write for 18 hours a week, no matter what. And as a result, I would often get to the end of the week. It's Friday. It's date night. And my girlfriend, Meredith, at that time would be looking forward to us going out. And I would say, nope, sorry, haven't written enough this week. I have to write to it tonight and all day tomorrow. So we'll see you maybe next weekend. And she married me anyway. Wow. What a woman. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that, that's pretty much the story. Play, played, in, played in bands. Uh, I do like to tell the story of I was in three bands in high school. And uh, we played in the Battle of Bands one time. There were four bands. I was in three of them and we lost, we lost, we lost. So oh, I, 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 didn't even, I didn't even win. <laughs> even stacking the deck didn't win. So uh, oh. the music journey, you know, has a lot of setbacks in it. Mm. And, and I always tell people, you know, for, for those nine number one songs you mentioned, that doesn't count the hundreds of songs mm. that were rejected out of hand, and never saw the light of day. Um, you know, a rose bush has way more thorns than roses. Mm. But boy, there is nothing more rewarding than seeing your song touch somebody's life. So it's been a long journey, but it's sure, sure been worth it. That's amazing. That's great. So what you're saying is be prepared to spend a lot of time in the woodshed to uh, new writers and writing a lot of bad songs and just okay songs and before and, getting to the gold, right? Yeah, every, everything you write is part of the growth process. God has no wasted motion. So those songs that are just helping you refine your craft are, are taking you down a road. It's a journey. And uh, the destination is a better song every time out, hopefully. Uh, you just keep learning uh, until young writers listen, 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 learn from the best. Learn from the best. That's great. Study your craft. Good words. So I need to get to the hot topic of the day, which is I would love for you to share with us. So you go from songwriting and three bands and some of those stories, which I'd love to talk about some of the stories with those bands, but we'll refrain from that for today because there I really, may be children listening. You know. Well, there's that, but they are absolutely hysterical, but let's move on to how did you get into music for the soul, writing music specifically for the hurting and the broken and traumatized. Well, I had been a Christian staff writer for uh, several years, but before I'd done that, I had done a project in Los Angeles. I still have it, lived out in Los Angeles. I'd done a project called uh, "I Can't Talk About It," which was for sexual abuse survivors. And so, if I if I may, I'll back up and and tell a little bit little bit about that because it really did set the stage for for music for the soul. I was living in L.A. I was trying to become a successful pop songwriter. And I've been banging my head against that wall for many, many years. And I finally had my first hit on the radio. So this is the moment you've waited for your whole life, right? So the song comes on the radio and I listen to it. And I don't know if any of your listeners would know the, the Peggy Lee song, Is That All There Is? But that's kind of how I felt when it was over. Because I thought, wow, there is absolutely nothing of me in that song. I was aping the culture, giving people what I thought they wanted. 
but it really wasn't an expression of who I was, and it was disposable. I thought this is disposable even to me. So <laughs> mm. uh, I went into our church. Our church was open 24-7, a place called the Little Brown Church in the Valley. And I just sat there in the middle of the night and just said, Lord, I know you gave me this gift of music. I also know that this is not what I'm supposed to be doing. So please show me what I'm supposed to be doing or show me that I'm not supposed to do music, whatever. I just want what I'm doing to be meaningful. And a few weeks later, a gentleman visited our church on one of the Sundays when I happened to play one of the three Christian lyric songs I'd written up to that point. And he called me a few days later out of the blue and said, hi, my name is Stephen. I, I'm, I'm starring in Les Rob at the Schubert Theater. And uh, I've licensed a, a book on childhood sexual abuse by two Christian authors. And I'm going to write a stage play and I wanted to have songs. And I think you're the guy who's supposed to write them. And I literally held the phone out and looked up at the ceiling and said, that's awfully specific, God. <laughs> but my goodness, as an answer to prayers go, that was a doozy. No went, doubt. Yeah, I went to meet with Stephen and he put this book on the, on the table and I looked into the eyes of the little girl on the cover and I said, I have no idea why you've called me, but I'll, I'll do it. And I went home, got down on my knees next to the piano for the first time in my life and said, Lord, this feels important. Please, please help me. And I wrote four songs based on the written content of that book. It was a, a picture book for kids, mainly. Mm. One of those songs was called Innocent Child. <laughs> and I, uh, you know, Stephen was the singer. I was the guy behind the curtain playing the piano at all of our events that we did at churches and what have you. And we got invited to an incest survivor conference in New Jersey. And Stephen couldn't go. He had a conflict. And we felt it was important that we be there. So I went and now I'm going to be the singer. I've never sung the song in person. I don't think of myself as a singer, but here we go. Got there, quickly ascertained, you're a Christian, strike one. You're a man, strike two. Actually, the reverse order, actually. You're a man, strike one. You're a Christian, strike two. Mm -hmm. The lady they put me at to share the, my merchandising table with, which had one little cassette in the book, right? So that's like around 1990. We're talking cassettes were still a thing. <laughs> and and uh, this lady was an atheist. And her approach was you get mad and you stay mad. That was like part of the, part of the way you, yeah. you heal, right? Sure. And she was very militant with me. I will tell you that by the end of the weekend, she endorsed our project. So oh, that yeah. was interesting. <laughs> but all weekend long, I was told, don't hug anybody. These women hate to be hugged by men who are strangers, which mm -hmm. totally made sense. Yeah. So now it's the closing ceremony of the weekend, and they want me to sing Innocent Child. And so there are 300 women in a circle in, in this ballroom, and there's a grand piano in the middle, and Steve will sing for us now. And I sat down, and I started to play the song, and I didn't get one or two lines in, but that I could hear the sobs coming from around the room. And it felt like somebody was standing behind me, pressing down on my shoulders as hard as they could. And I started to have trouble breathing. And I thought, I'm, I'm going to pass out. Lord, please, God, I don't want to pass out, right? Uh -huh. So slow the song down. I'm gasping for breath in between, in between each direct line. I get to the end, and I, I just burst into convulsive sobs mm. like I'd never had in public before. I mean, sloppy, messy sobbing. Mm. And buried my face in my hands for several minutes. I don't know how long. Mm. But when I finally pulled myself together and I looked up, there was a line of women waiting to hug me. That would have been enough, except for one of the women said to me, people have been telling me I was an innocent child my whole life. I never believed it until I heard you sing it today. Hmm. And I thought, I'm supposed to do something about that. And I don't know what it is. Music for the Soul, which took another 10 or 12 years to be born. Music for the Soul is me doing something about that about the fact that a song can communicate healing and freedom in a way that nothing else can. So good and absolutely true. And as you know, that song, there's such a story behind that song. And hopefully we can talk about that soon someday and how that song and that project connected you and I, and I'm eternally grateful. And I'm eternally grateful for your obedience to that calling in your life 
because I've not only been blessed and gifted with the opportunity to watch all of this at work in the lives of other people through projects that came later, but I've experienced it myself firsthand. Um, I wonder if you could talk for a moment. You know, you mentioned the woman who said, people have been telling me this all my life, but when you sang it, it finally clicked for her. Can you talk, share a little bit about the science behind that? Because it's not just a feeling situation when it comes to music. There's actual brain science involved here. Yes, uh, when we speak to someone, it's mainly processed in the left hemisphere of the brain. And trauma, it turns out, resides primarily in the right hemisphere of the brain, which just happens to be where melody is processed. So when you sing to somebody, you're bringing the mind from the left and the heart from the right, and you're combining them. You get your, you've got the whole brain involved now. And music is processed instantaneously. That's why you can be driving down the road and, and a song comes on, and bam, you're back in high school, or a song comes on and you're crying almost instantly and you don't know why or what, whatever, right? It, it just, it can instantaneously transport you. And I, I like to say that songs, you know, when you just speak to somebody, it, it's just the left hemisphere of the brain. And if they don't want to hear it, if their defenses are up, those words just bounce off the wall, right? Not letting that in, okay. but music is like water that seeps through the cracks in the walls of defenses or that goes under the closed door. And before a person knows it, their heart has been softened and that heart opens up. And now we can lay that healing message in there because the resistance is down. Wow. Wow. So I wonder if you could share a little bit too. I know that a ton of therapists use Music for the Soul projects and resources in their counseling offices to reach the traumatized client who perhaps has blocked emotion and his dealing with things different in different ways. I'm wondering, have you had uh, testimonials? Is there one that stands out in particular that you could share with us? Wow. That's, that's a hard, that's a hard question. You know, <laughs> that's like saying, which of your children do you love the best? You know, which, <laughs> okay. Just you know, one. It doesn't have to be your most favorite. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think the, the one that always leaps to mind for me because I just never would have known to imagine such a thing. Uh, there's a therapist that uses uh, our Somebody's Daughter project to help heal couples who have had uh, pornography, sexual betrayal of any kind uh, has damaged their marriage. And he has like a year long process that he walks people through. And he uses several of, of the songs from our project Somebody's Daughter in that process. But the thing, he just could have knocked me over with a feather when he told me that at the end of that process, he has couples remarry in his office, symbolically, right? And he plays our song from that project free as a way to say, this is a new place that you've come to. You are now free from the past and your marriage has been renewed and you can move forward from here. And he described this couple to me dancing in his office as husband and wife healed, their marriage vows renewed, their marriage restored. And I just was like, you can do that? What, what are you talking about? That's just incredible. Wow. So I love that story because I, because I can see it. You know, uh -huh. I can see that visual. And for any of us who are married, you remember your first dance and all that. So just <laughs> it, there's a sweetness to that that you wouldn't expect to emerge from something so ugly and potentially devastating. That's a beautiful story. Thanks so much for sharing that. And I know that there are countless stories like that. And I'm so blessed to have my own collection of stories and how people have come to me just blessed and a little more healed mm -hmm. after uh, utilizing some of the resources at Music for the Soul and some of our music. And I just love that you can go to the website and you can look up whatever immediate issue that is at hand. And there's music and sometimes uh, written resources for people. And you can look at the lyrics and you can listen to the song for free. And it's just, it's incredible what is out there. The, the catalog is just so extensive. And 
so many wonderful songs. I'm wondering, is there one in particular that comes to mind? Maybe one of the earliest songs that you wrote for Music for the Soul? We talked about Innocent Child. Are there any other ones that come to mind to you? Well, there's one song, there's one song that actually predates the ministry by quite a bit. I didn't realize when I was working on it that it was a a ministry song or, you know, an issue oriented Mm. song is is the way some people would refer to it. But uh, I just went out one morning and picked up the morning newspaper and read this article about a young woman. She was 14 who had run away from her home in Kansas because it was an abusive home. Mm. And she thought she would move to to Southern California because it's sunny all the time. And that that would be a safe place for her to run away to. And as it turns out, within a very short period of time, she was being prostituted. Mm. And so I went to the piano and I wrote a song for her. Why don't we listen to a little bit of that right now? of broken glass running from pain that she can't outlast an innocent victim of her past she hitches a ride in a state 40 towards Hollywood maybe there she will be understood at least she knows that the way So anyway, Renee is 14. Uh, Mm -hmm. I think for anybody who knows Melody and who has listened to to Paul McCartney, they'll recognize who I was trying to be (laughs) melodically (laughs) in that song. But anyway, that song has had an incredible journey. Mm -hmm. I just want to tell one thing. I, I got this photograph from a teacher and a letter, a teacher in New York, who had used that song. She'd played it in her classroom and she'd asked, each of her students to write a letter to Renee. Mm. She was trying to sensitize, these were middle schoolers, she was trying to sensitize them to the plight of of runaways and to the issue of sex trafficking. And she thought this would personalize it. And she put all the letters on a trifold and sent it to me. Wow. One of my most prized things I've ever received. So that song, that that song has has been really something. And, And there's actually one story I should probably tell One of our board members was uh, on a radio show with a talk show host out on the West Coast. And during the the show, the lady told her about a ministry she had to young girls in in the in the San Francisco area. And so my board member thought, well, this this will be great. I'll send her a copy of Renee's 14 and maybe that'll bless the, the young ladies that she's serving. And she got this really angry phone call back. And the lady was like, why did you send this to me? And my board member was like stunned, like what? What was what? Yeah. <laughs> and and the lady said, "I am Renee." And I know she wasn't speaking literally; she was speaking metaphorically. But her story was that she'd been abused as a young girl multiple times, mm-hmm. and unbeknownst to my board member, the week before she sent the song, this lady had had a gun in her mouth, mm-hmm. ready to end it. Wow. And, and later on, uh, she was able to tell me. And thank me and and tell me that that song saved her life. Wow, that is incredible. What an incredible story. And that song is obviously really powerful and powerfully written, especially given the fact that this was like kind of that first out of the gate kind of song. And you probably had no idea, right? When you wrote it, you had no idea that one day it would be used. No, I I wrote that song because... The story was so painful, I couldn't hold it inside. Mm. Uh, I think songwriters all process their lived experience, the things that are going on in their hearts and heads in the writer's room. 
I certainly do. I've never been a journaler because I pour everything out into my songs. My songs mm -hmm. are sort of a de facto journal, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote that song, you know, I, I said earlier that I wrote it for Renee. I actually wrote it more for me because mm -hmm. I, I couldn't hold the pain. So the fact that God would take what was essentially a self-serving act on my part <laughs> and use it to bless so many people is immensely humbling. He wastes yeah. nothing, right? It has amazed me to hear the songs that you have written over the years, and they're not necessarily your story. And I know that you've shared this with writers all over. I'd love for you to share with our audience today, how do you write a song about that when it's not your story? It's a lot, oftentimes it's easy to emote into music when you're a writer, when it's your stuff. Mm -hmm. But sometimes we're called to write for other people, for other circumstances that maybe we haven't walked through. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, there's a great story that comes to mind about that because it was one of those things that I'd never really thought about and, mm -hmm. and was kind of put on the hot seat. It was in regard to uh, the Somebody's Daughter project I mentioned earlier, and we were filming the documentary that goes with it. And I was visiting with one of the producers of the documentary. And he was trying to get some more background information to, you know, to better understand what they were going to be shooting. And he said, so, Steve, when you were dealing with your addiction to pornography, you know, how did how did you get get through that? <laughs> and I said, oh, well, that, you know, that's not my story. And I saw his his face turn red and he got really angry. And he said, how dare you presume to write about something that you haven't lived through? I mean, he was really angry. and. I said, well, you know, I said, it's like there's this closet with a bunch of hangers in it. And on each hanger is a coat of pain. Mm. And I said, when I go to work on a project, I take that coat of pain off the hanger and I put it on and I wear it for as long as I need to, to understand from the inside out some of what a person might feel in that situation. I said, you know, we do a ton of reading, a ton of interviews with people and pray and pray and pray and then show what we write to therapists and survivors of the issue and say, is this it? Is this what it feels like? And when they get that wide-eyed look and say, that's me, that's what it felt like, then we're ready to write that song. And it's then that I can take that coat of pain off, put it back on the hanger, put it back in the closet and do the project. I said, if I had actually been through everything we've written about, I'd be a jellyfish. I would <laughs> Right. There's no way. There's no way. And in that regard, I think I'm no different than anybody who's a professional counselor. I mean, the, not, I'm not comparing myself to counselors. What they do is extraordinary and they're mm -hmm. on the front lines and it's a whole different thing. But you don't have to have been through every issue under the sun to be an effective counselor. Mm -hmm. And I think the same is true for songwriters. What I would say is it requires a great deal of commitment and it's, it's a great responsibility this is sacred ground you're walking on to, and you should treat it like that. For sure. For sure. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. You did mention that documentary of Somebody's Daughter, which is a great project too. I want to ask about what's coming up here for you. What's next for Music for the Soul? Well, we have a couple things. There's always a couple things working and <laughs> several other things that want to be working. And I, I try to you know focus my attention, but the the two things that we're working on right now, one is a documentary on the issue of sexual abuse called Innocent Child. And the other is a music project on the issue of anxiety. It's interesting because so many of our issues sound really scary, right? You know, suicide, grief, eating disorders, pornography, addiction, they, they are frightening things. Anxiety sounds relatively benign, but it's not at all because it's at the root of fear and depression and all kinds of, of negative acting out as people mm -hmm. try to numb their pain. And according to the counselors that we speak with, it is now the number one issue devastating humankind, mm -hmm. basically. Absolutely. So we felt like this would be a good time to really hunker down, sit with that. We're going to have a writer's retreat where we focus on that. And there's no time frame for how long it'll take. People always say, well, when's this coming out? Mm -hmm. And the answer is that these things come out when they're done. And 
they're usually in the oven a lot longer than I would like them to be. You know, if it were up to me, they'd all take 20 minutes and, and, and right. You know, because <laughs> if it were music, only that easy. <laughs> right, well, the, the, the hard part of music for the soul, one of the hard parts is that the need is great and the need is now. Mm-hmm. The need is yesterday, right? Yeah. For yeah. people who are caught in these issues. Right. So, you know, to be caught up in like, you know, the time it takes to fundraise, to do a, a mm-hmm. world-class documentary, to be caught up in the time it takes to thoughtfully write songs on an mm-hmm. issue as complicated as anxiety. These things are time intensive, they're expensive, mm-hmm. but we are committed to doing things. I, I said from the beginning, if we're going to say this is of God, then it has to be excellent. Mm-hmm. Can't rush, Absolutely. can't cut corners. And, and that's been extremely frustrating to me, but I try to take solace in the fact that this is not just my work. This is the work of creatives everywhere. There are mm-hmm. lots of great songwriters. There are lots mm-hmm. of great documentarians. There's lots of wonderful content being creative. We'll do our part. We'll do it as, as best we can and as quickly as we feel is responsible. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, it's, it's not all on us. And if we ever think that, then our ego has gotten too big. For sure. For sure. And, Boy, anything in our own strength, the flesh profits nothing, I believe is the saying, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I would just kind of like to offer this opportunity to our listeners to actually invite them to become partners with us at Music for the Soul in putting some of these very expensive, time-consuming projects out that will reach the hurting and the broken and the weary we want to offer them the opportunity today to partner with us. And what is the best way to go about that? Or what are some, and maybe some ways that people partner with us? There are lots of ways because there's so much different content with Music for the Soul. There are, like we've said, there are documentaries, there are discussion guides, there are books, there are songs, there are in the old days, we used to call them albums. Now, now we just call them projects. And of course, there's this podcast. So I would encourage people, if anything we've done has blessed them, that they would pray and think about who in their life might need to know about it. We don't have an extensive marketing budget. In fact, uh, several years we've had literally no marketing budget. And so (laughs) word of mouth becomes extremely important. If someone is in a church and they feel like their church is the kind of place where people can talk honestly about difficult things or need to be able to, Mm -hmm. and they realize the power of music, they could possibly speak to uh, their pastor or or somebody in the church about purchasing our our catalog. We make it very affordable, $235 for everything we've ever done. And we can deliver that digitally, physically, however it serves the the congregation. Same thing if if somebody's working with a therapist and feels like their therapist is in tune to working with music. Lots of therapists use our catalog, and we would offer the same deal to the therapist. By the way, that deal includes shipping, because I know people would probably wonder about that. So purchasing, talking us up, people sometimes want to volunteer. Really, the only thing in terms of volunteering that we can offer for anybody who lives outside of the Nashville area, we do something called an evening of healing songs and stories, where we can come to your community and present songs and the stories behind them and minister, you know, in person. It works really well in a chapel setting. And so that's something that people could do. And of course, if they do that, then they're volunteering simply by being the the connection and the person who will help publicize and, and get things rolling in their own faith community. So those are just three ways. And I'm sure there are more. You might know some that I haven't mentioned. Did you mention donations? I did not. And okay. You know, I was just going to say, because for some people, the volunteering isn't really an option. And for some people, you know, they may not be in a place to host a a home concert or a a concert in their church or whatever. You know, sometimes the best that they've got at the moment is to give finance to help fund getting these projects out to the people. It's interesting because... You know, if people are wondering if I'm in this for the money, I think I just proved I'm not. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, I think so. (laughs) And I was about to say my board of directors would hit me with a board for not mentioning (laughs) that opportunity. When you're nonprofit. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's right. Uh, Donations to Music for the Soul are tax deductible. And people, there are lots of different things that people can support within our ministry. So if someone Mm. wants to, to talk with me by email or phone or whatever, they can reach out and we can talk about 
what in our ministry might resonate with them. I think it's very important. I always want people to give, not because they feel like they ought to, Mm -hmm. but because there's an opportunity to be a part of something. And when you create songs and and the songs and the films that Music for the Soul creates, those have a life and they Mm -hmm. go out there and they minister on and on and on. Uh, we, We talked about a song earlier today that literally is almost as old as my marriage (laughs) that is out there still touching lives. So these, you know, um, these are opportunities to have a legacy. So I I would invite anybody who who would be interested in that to to reach out so we can talk about it. And where can they reach out to? Steve at musicforthesoul.org is my email address. And of course, that's also on the website. So Wonderful. And uh, I just want to encourage our listeners, if you feel led to support the ministry in whatever fashion that is being laid on your heart to do so, follow up on that. Don't forget it. I know that I I get passionate about different things. I kind of let it fall by the way. Said, oh, I'll do it tomorrow. And then I forget. I just want to encourage you to jump on that pressing upon your heart to join us in bringing healing music and hope into a very dark and hurting world. Steve, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, You are a blessing and I appreciate personally all that you do uh, to gift this world with some hope and healing. And I just want to thank you for sharing your heart and a little bit of the history of music for the soul and how it came to be. Thank you so much. It's been a blessing. If you enjoyed the discussion today, please share it with a friend and give us a positive review on iTunes. And please visit our website, musicforthesoul.org, where you can stream or download every song in our catalog, including Renee's 14. Read our lyrics, our healing music guide, our blog posts, and much more. Thank you so much for listening. And Becky, thank you for having me as your guest. (laughs) It was my pleasure. God bless you, everybody. A family like pieces of broken glass Running from pain that she can't outlast An innocent victim of her past She hitches a ride In a state 40 towards Hollywood Maybe there she will be understood knows that the weather's good She arrives with dreams But she's in beyond her means And inside her a child's voice Screams for someone to care Renee needs a home She squats in a shack down on Gardner Street In the shadow of wealth and the town's elite Wondering each day what she'll have to eat She sells what she must She'd rather not, but there's no way out Survival becomes what her world's about On the street, money is all that counts No time for tears Anger hurts less than fear Heart beyond her years And too tired to care Renee is alive But each day one more part of her soul is dead Could we have afforded to turn